Hello, everybody, and welcome to any newcomers, and welcome to Norts, who's deputising for Simon Mann today, and particularly welcome to one of my favourite bowlers of all time, a World Cup winner. He's been described there in our introduction as uh, the middle overs enforcer and someone who's going to be appearing in a different country soon for a different uh, in a different competition. Anyway, delighted to say that uh, Liam Plunkett has joined the world's best Greek club. Welcome, Liam. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you for, uh, for giving up your time. And as a man who uh, roves around the world quite a bit, where are you now? I'm at home, uh, just outside of Harrogate, mate. So, uh, yeah, it's, we're just getting our stuff together. Uh, obviously making a, the move across to TUSA, hopefully, uh, middle of November, just before Thanksgiving over there. So it's... Uh, yeah, it's looking forward to it, getting, getting stuff done, trying to do some level three coaching, keep myself occupied. Uh, so, yeah, and, and lovely Harrogate. That's fascinating uh, development in your in your career that you're now, you've, you've said goodbye to sort of English cricket, really, and uh, in, in a sort of, in a nice way, and uh, sort of looking at new challenges. So tell us, tell us what you are going to be doing. In terms of... I've still left myself open to maybe play some white ball cricket in England next year. Uh, but obviously the priority now is go going across to the States. I'm going to be working with the major league uh, MLC. Uh, so pretty much doing the, the poor, man, poor man's Beckham, uh, doing the cricket version of that. Uh, so I'm going to be coaching the minor leagues, uh, the major league academy. And also I think I'll be working with uh, the next crop of USA players. Uh, and then that's during the winter times. And when it comes to the summertime, that's when the minor leagues and the major league starts. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact dates are for the minor leagues, but I know it's towards the back end, of maybe August, September time, the major league starts. I think that's like a three, four week competition, uh, franchise style, when you get the superstars across, going to be spread around uh, the USA. So uh, yeah, it's exciting. I'm, I'm really excited to get involved in it, but also the coaching side of it. That's what uh, sort of getting my... Uh, uh, yeah, kind of, mate. So it's, I still want to play. It's just not playing too much this year uh, with injuries and that kind of stuff is you lose uh, what it feels like to play. So I'm, as, as soon as I get back to cricket and start bowling the nets and hitting some balls, I'll get that passion back straight away. It's, it's a brilliant opportunity. Um, was, it, was it a difficult decision? Not, re not really, mate. Uh, I suppose it got uh, put to me a few years back. Uh, but obviously I'd signed, uh, obviously with, I think it was after the World Cup, maybe the conversation after the World Cup. Uh, and some, I spoke to someone about uh, what was going to happen in America and the investments they put into it. And people spoke to me about what they were trying to do and what goals they were trying to set and all that good stuff. But then that was just a brief chat. And it was only down the line a bit further that I got introduced again by different people and the guys who are running uh, the Major League Cricket uh, and yeah, so it just came about that. But I always said that I was with Surrey and I wanted to fulfil my contract. Uh, I didn't want to start worrying about going to, to USA and playing Major League Cricket. If I had a blinder this year with Surrey and they offered me another year or two, then I might have took that. Uh, but it came when I'd been injured a little bit and they came with the opportunity, uh, right, this is uh, a three-year contract in terms of you're going to play and also the coaching side, it'd be stupid not to. With my wife being in Philadelphia, it was also good to get somewhere and drop our roots and hopefully obviously settle down a little bit. So um, g g give us a sense of um, the teams, because um, I know the major league uh, uh, aims are to have, I think it's either six or eight teams, but you're talking about Philadelphians will be in the minor leagues, will they? Is that right? Yeah, that, that started this year. I'm not yes. sure exact numbers and what, but I think there's a lot of teams that maybe 26, 27 teams. Uh, and obviously they're filtered into the major leagues. So I think it's the first time in obviously USA where people uh, from USA and the expats who obviously are allowed to play for USA now, it's the first time there's a route to a professional career in cricket. Mm. So it's hopefully it's going to get a big, uh, yeah, a lot of people joining in, a lot more interest. Mm. And, and that's what you want. I mean, people going across like myself who obviously are not from USA, I'm not trying to play for USA, but eventually down the line, you want people who are born there, who are bred in America to represent USA. But it's, right now, it's great for the USA sport. People are going across because it's going to make the standard a lot better. Uh, the youngsters coming through are going to get play against international experience. I know Corey Anderson's there. Marcel's going to be across there. So they get to play against a uh, good standard of cricketers and obviously raise their game. 
And, and actually, um, you're, you're being inspiration to them from a kind of working preparation, training, all that point of view as well. Um, actually, I, I mean, I I was in uh, Dubai, as many of our members know, a couple of weeks ago, and I went to a, one IPL game. And um, I was with some Americans, actually, who've invested in the Rajasthan Royals uh, franchise. And they live in Texas. And they were talking about the future of uh, the US, you know, game cricket and they were really positive i mean they sort of said they think it will take 10 years perhaps to really capture the the imagination but of course there is such a south asian indian uh community out there who are already interested so i suppose it's it's going to be quite hard to ca- to capture the, the the white population maybe but what what's your sense when you because you I know you spend a fair bit of time out there already and you you've trained on you've trained for cricket on baseball diamonds and stuff. Um, I mean, what what is the kind of interest in cricket there generally? I think you said uh, more the expats and Asian like the Indian guys and the Pakistani guys, Bangladeshi guys who are coming across and who've been there at school or uh, third generation who've been obviously brought up here and they've been sort of. Uh, cricket's been brought to them by the parents or grandparents. Uh, as I said, there was a cricket facility probably 30 miles from my house in Westchester in, in America, and I didn't know nothing about it until 10 years down the line. So it's obviously it's not uh, out there. It's not like people don't know about it. It's only now that the last few years where they're trying to obviously invest in that money uh, and trying to push it. Uh, it. It's exciting to me. Obviously, it's uh, that's what you want. I want to help the, the sport grow there. And it is starting now, it's ground zero pretty much, and it's going to take some time, but hopefully with the plans have got in place, you're looking to have maybe the World Cup down the line, they're trying to get yeah. into the Olympics in like a T10 format. Uh, so that's, uh, what's that, eight years down the line, seven years down the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know they're making a, a massive push push uh, to try and get like the teachers around uh, the kindergarten schools and I don't know what the primary sort of schools there to just to know what cricket is, to be able to pick up a bat and ball and show the kids what it actually looks like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, going back and forth to America, when I used to first go across and speaking to my wife's friends, uh, they thought I was a croquet player, uh, rode around on a horse, all that good stuff. So it was, uh, yeah, it took a while. I think they might just know what it is now, mate. So. <laughs> yeah. hey, um, hey, Simon Hughes, just a quick, uh, the poor man, Simon Mann here, by the way. Uh, I just want to say, Liam, that I actually, uh, I brought someone on board today. I'm not going to bring him in. They might want to come on. I got out of a chap there called Nate Hay, who I believe you spoke to previously. So he's uh, he's somewhere in in amongst. It. Obviously, he's he knows nice. a lot about the American scene because uh, he's over there and he writes about it. But um, yeah, maybe Nate. I see he's popped up in the chat already. If he can give us some extra insight and wisdom, that I would think be that it. he'd be the man to speak to. I did a podcast with him uh, a while back now. And- I think he knows the ins and outs of... Uh, he says 27 teams, actually, on the chat box. So that's obviously um, up-to-date. It's amazing, really. I mean, it, it just shows, you know, there's a lot happening. And, I mean, just picking up on your point about uh, the Olympics, I did an interview, uh, which I've mentioned to this group, about uh, with the new ICC chairman, Greg Barkley, the Kiwi. Um, it's in the next issue of The Cricketer. And one of the things he talks about is the Olympics and how they're, they're meeting in Dubai... Uh, in two weeks, the ICC after the World T20s. And they're going to talk about the Olympics very, very seriously. And the idea is to, A, be an Olympic sport at 2028 LA Olympics, and also to lead up to that, to host um, a World T20 in the US uh, in partnership with the West Indies. So you could see, you know, in four or five years' time, not only a a tournament played in the, the, the US but also an Olympics with cricket in it and Liam Plunkett appearing for USA. <laughs> no, I took myself out of that, mate. Unless it, uh, it goes really bad and they need a, a 40-year-old bloke running into ball, then uh, I, I took myself out of that equation. So uh, Darren Stevens is 46, isn't he? Shoaib Malik is about 75 and he's doing all right, <laughs> isn't he? Yeah, the, the Pakistanis is- have got at least two over 40, exactly, and they're playing well. Don't me, don't write me, it off, mate. Don't write it. Jimmy Anderson, look at Jimmy. For, for me to ball straight, I have to have some pace behind it. So if I get to 42 and I'm balling 75 miles an hour, it'll be down leg side or spread offside. Listen, so, uh, listen. No. Learn to swing it then. 
<laughs> That's me this winter, mate. I'll Actually, get, although there's no point in learning to swing a white ball, is there? Because it's not going to work. Unless no, only for the first few balls. Bit. Only for the first few few balls yeah. or overs yeah. now. So. Oh well. Anyway, I mean, you know, it's it's a fascinating prospect. Um, and and how do you find um, you know, a, a lad from I think you were born in Middlesbrough, weren't you? Is that right? Yeah. How do you find life in the states? Do you like? Do you enjoy it? Does it feel weird? I and mean, what's it like? Uh, no, it feels like I'm from Middlesbrough. Uh, obviously, I love where I'm from. Uh, great childhood and all that good stuff. And this feels like home now in Harrogate because of that lockdown period where I spent so much time here. Because you're always on the road and stuff like that. I, I never spent too much time here, but during the first lockdown, it was obviously one of the added things that I got to spend time here. But going to the States now, that, that feels like home to me also. We've had that house now uh, how long, maybe nine, ten years. Uh, so I feel comfortable going there. I've spent a lot of time there over the last 14 years. So obviously when you first go over a guy from Middlesbrough and you think of America and New York and all this good stuff in the movies and stuff, and then all, all of a sudden you, you're across there. But yeah, I, I love it there. Uh, I can hopefully see myself being there uh, and retiring there. I've got uh, obviously a good family over there. Uh, and a good uh, friend connection so yeah okay well that sounds good Let, let's go back to your um your english uh, sort of um uh, you know progress evolution um i'm just going to play uh, a little bit of um a wicket that you took in a one day international because of course you're you're well known and we 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 described you uh, in the intro there as the um the mid overs specialist sort of thing um Actually, I don't know if this has worked. I just want to go. Shit, I've got the wrong thing here. Sorry. Right. So th this is um, this is a wicket of we'll recognise who in just a second. So let's just watch it first. England will be fearful here. This partnership's now worth ninety-one. Oh, it's a carry. Right, it's hard to be sure. England have convinced it's carry, and David Villiers is happy about it. Far and away for the umpire. Good old fashioned half volley right there. The very important. Get wickets when people are chasing you back to the end. It's just a little more difficult. That's the village of Plunky, Sheed, Alley, the wicket taking bowlers. So um, I'll, I'll stop it there actually because. Um, I know where that goes. What is that a six? <laughs> I think I so. Know. Let's yeah. have a look. Is that a six? Have a look. No, 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 I think I cut off there. Um, so that was a bit of a rough edit by me. But um, the point about sort of showing that, I suppose, was that I thought it encapsulated uh, your role in the one day side. Firstly, getting a big name out like A.B. de Villiers there. And secondly, getting wickets which don't necessarily look glamorous wickets. They're not kind of, you know, pitch leg and hit off or some brilliant in swing or something. But there's a subtlety to, to your bowling. That, that takes wickets, um, you know, without necessarily looking glamorous. But, I mean, it's just as important in a way. Yeah, I mean, I mean when I first started, I used to try and swing it when I first played for England, open the ball and, uh, and through, through time and action and dip a form and that kind of stuff. Uh, I went the other way and started to ball quick when I joined Yorkshire and that sort of enforcer role. And I didn't really see myself playing in the one-day stuff. It was only... I got injured in a couple of test matches and I think I went into the white ball squad and Morgan seen me, he had, he had a, a role for me, which was that middle period. I used to obviously went out when I was maybe before the World Cup, the four years leading in, the first couple of years I'd run from ball 90 miles an hour and quite hostile and stuff like that. But as time went on, you sometimes dip in, in pace uh, or maybe not as quick all the time. I mean, in the World Cup, I can still 
uh, the odd ball, you ball 90 miles an hour or 92 miles an hour, but you're generally working at 80 to 85. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in terms of me, it doesn't swing when I ball. So it's like what, what works for me. I'm very fortunate that we had good opening balls who put the pressure on and always took wickets. So sometimes they did come after you, uh, first change. And I would just stick to, stick to my best ball. A lot of the time, I'd run up and ball cross seam with a couple of different grips. I'd hold the, the a cross seam with, in your fingers in the middle and then further deep in. So there's three different deliveries, which a tiny bit of change that nobody sees. And it might come out a couple of miles an hour difference each time. So I'd, that's what I love to do. Be aggressive, hit top of the stumps, change my grip with a cross seam, ball some cutters, some leg cutters, and try and just read the batsman. I think a lot of time you get people out by rigging the batsman. It doesn't have to be the perfect delivery, but if you know where they're going to score and where the weakness is and you set them fields uh, and get them hitting to, to the side they don't want to hit to, that's how you pick up the wickets. So I think a lot of the time I did try and figure out the batsman and it's you watch so much cricket on TV and there's so much video put in front of you. You can you can look where people don't score and how they get out in the past and where you want them to hit. I'll like, say the last wicket that got caught mid-off is mm. probably not the not the strongest hitting over the top of there. You want to, he's trying to hit the opposite side. So mm. generally it was always a plan uh, and, and that's what you go with. So were you, uh, were you very into, you know, analyzing individual batsmen? Did you look up sort of closely where they tended to hit, you know, and therefore set your field and bowl, you know, slightly differently to what they were, they were, they wanted. I would look, I would sometimes get uh, the video footage on my phone and just watch it by myself, like maybe over a coffee the day before or before I went to bed. I would never want to see footage of people hitting sixes and fours that did nothing for me. That's obviously where their strong points are. Where's the dot balls? Where are the wicked balls? How can I get them off strike? So I would look at look at that. But I said there's mm. so much footage on, on TV that you, you generally know where people's weaknesses are. Like obviously people like Warner and stuff, you can ball uh, to his hip a little bit and he tries to force it. Obviously gets out a little bit like that. Don't want to give him whip or... Uh, but yeah, not too much. I just try to keep mm. it as simple as possible. Mm. Obviously, being from Middlesbrough, that's pretty much simple. Simple. <laughs> oh, I, but it's but it's it's subtly it's subtlety as well. Um, where where would you bowl to Joss Butler? That's the thing. It's so hard because they know exactly what you do. Uh, they they know exactly where you're going to bowl, and you have got to keep figuring them out and try and read them where they're going to where they're going to look to score. Yeah. And he's trying to read you, of course, as well, and looking at the field and 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 I suppose you can be. Uh, can you can you deceive batsmen by setting the field? Let's say you set the field uh, with a, a man in the ring at short mm -hmm. fine, so that implies you're going to go full uh, and not short because a top yeah. edge is going to go for four or six or something over the short fine leg's head. But then you bowl short because he you think he thinks you're going to bowl full. Yeah, absolutely. I think in T20 you have your rules and stuff like that. You stick to your uh, plan A, plan B sometimes and then you do have to do that. If someone's in can you just get them to think for a, a minuscule of a second and obviously the ball's been past them there's a dot ball or you make them think a tiny bit and then the squirt on for one rather than trying to put you into the stands people like Joss and the guys who play 360 it's so hard, that's why they're so valuable and they do so well and they go for big money in the IPL and stuff like that it's because it's quite hard to ball to mm. uh, anyone who can play 360 and play pace play spin uh, it's hard to ball to, and that's just the modern day cricketer. So, need, so how need... do you how do you deal with the the um, just explain to people because you know we will most of us. I mean, certainly me and probably a lot of people on this. You know, we grow up with bowling maiden overs and um, you know conceding. I, I'm embarrassed to say I think my economy rate in list day was like four or something. You know, four and over. I mean, ridiculous because no yeah. one attempted to do much. Um, so how do you kind of, you, you started in an era just about when T20 began, 2003, um, you know, you've had to come to terms with suddenly four overs for 40 or, uh, you know, 10 overs for 70 or something. I mean, how do you kind of change your mindset to accommodate that? I think over time, it, it's just the way the game's going. If you know, if they're getting big scores on the board, 350 or 330, whatever like that, and everyone's going for the same sort of runs and people will ball well, that's just the, the way the game's going. I, I remember I was playing for Durham against Surrey and I went for 50 off 10 and I was devastated. I think I sulked on the bus on the way home, but now it's mm. people go for 85 and people don't bat an eyelid. Mm. Uh, 
and they, if someone goes for 100 now, it's obviously not the best result, but people are like, oh, well, he's had a bad day. It's like Mick Lewis went for 100, then I don't think he played much after that. It was like... <laughs> I think Mick Lewis went for 110. God. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Mm. I went to Melbourne Stars then, actually. He was the bowling coach. I'm not sure how much I was going to listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm just one other question about the bowling sort of skills. I mean, you talked about there about the. I'll just get. I'm just going to grab a ball here. Actually, I should get a white one, shouldn't I? Um, you talked about you know your different grips, uh, deeper in your hand, middle position, further forward, and all that. Who taught you that? I mean, who who was your biggest? Im- I know Trevor Bayliss said go away and and learn some new tricks, but who did you get those tricks off? Which bowler or coach or whatever was the biggest influence on you? I think in terms of the cross team, I think it when I, when I was playing for Yorkshire in red ball cricket, I think I was just running up ball and cross team and it, I had better control of it. Maybe at the start when I've come back and I struggled for Durham and I joined Yorkshire, I was more confident. I wasn't back in my action at that time and I was worried about it swinging and going for wides and obviously you're looking stupid and all that kind of stuff. So I just went around the wicket, ball cross team, didn't worry about the swing and then just sort of got into my action and then be three overs down the line. I felt my action was complete and I was hitting the pitch hard. I'll then maybe ball seam up. But when it comes to the, the variations and stuff, I think you can't just sit on one ball all the time. And if someone sees a slow ball coming and they can see it coming out of your hand, they're just going to sit back and slap it. But if you have the just subtle variations, which I, I feel like I did, because I didn't have the back of the hand, I didn't really ball a knuckle ball. So it's like, what variations can I have? As I said, that makes someone... Uh, Check, check a drive and get caught cover or miss hit it and get caught long on, long off. Uh, it was, what can I do to stay in the team? So you just practice that. You practice your wobble balls, uh, which I think Stuart Clark used to bowl that really well in the Ashes. I remember when I was on that Ashes tour and he, he was cleaning up, he bowled accurate. He wasn't trying to swing it. He was just trying to hit, wobble the seam down. One will go in, one will go out, but it was always from a consistent area. So I think I maybe started to do that. That just popped in my head. I, I might try that, see how that comes out. So it's just, yeah, in, in six balls, you could have not really changed your grip too much, but you bought six different deliveries. Right. So not only were you a, a, a middle overs wicket taker, and I think you took more wickets in the middle overs in four years, didn't you, than anyone else. Um, but also, of course, you were a fantastic fielder and a very dangerous lower order batsman. So let's just watch one of your finest moments with the bat here. Um, which I'm sure you remember very well. It was uh, it was a Sri Lanka game. It was uh, at Trent Bridge, and the uh, in fact I remember Jonathan Agnew I think on radio saying, "Oh, England have lost. You know they can't win, or they can't. It's a, it's a you know because you actually needed uh, seven to win, didn't you? You needed seven to win, and everyone thought, oh, well, that's it, no good. So let's see what you did as a result. Last ball, seven to win." Going to the very last ball. That's a perfect move. So you see extra cover there. I think people always forget, ball. like that ball is under the pump as well. He, he's yeah. probably breaking it. He hasn't yeah. missed, missed a Yorker all night, so he's probably shitting his pants as well. So. He's still in pocket. Very nice. What a shot. Jeez. I think they messed up the ball before because we ran a three. Uh, it shouldn't have been a two. They messed up in the field and we managed to squeeze a three, which gives a chance to tie the game. I mean, it was extraordinary, wasn't it? Um, uh, absolutely brilliant shot. There I mean, you go. Andy Roylance in the club. Andy Roylance was there in the crowd. It? So was I. Um, I, I. I remember I was just sat behind Mark Nicholas and... Um, and Vaughan on this shot. I mean, I just love watching this again. It was such a clean hit. And it was your first ball as well. Hadn't it? I think you hadn't faced a ball, had you, before that? No, no, I think I was on 20 or something like that. Oh, were you? Okay. No, I, I give you um, too much credit then. Anyway, I mean, amazing, <laughs> amazing shot, though. Absolutely remarkable. And uh, I just saw Paul Farbrace in the background of the picture there. Did you hear, did you hear the news about him today, by the way? I didn't. What's that? Jo- you're joining Middlesex. Oh, really? As... Taking over at Middlesex as, uh, I presume, director of cricket. Stuart Law apparently has been um, let go and uh, Farby's back at his one of his homes. So 
exciting. Anyway, I mean, um, batting, uh, you know, very valuable uh, impact you had there. Um, I suppose just just a couple of other questions before we get the um, our members to, to go have a go. Um, just, just tell us about the feeling of being in that side, that World Cup side, not necessarily winning the World Cup, but through that kind of period, 2016 to 19, what was it like? Yeah, honestly, it was it was amazing. Such, it didn't feel like in one aspect, it didn't feel like you were playing international cricket. It felt like you were playing with your mates. It felt like you would turn up to practice, and then all of a sudden you're on a big stage, international cricket, and everyone's watching you. But everyone wanted to get better all the time, and that was the thing. Everyone turned up, and the net sessions were were tough. That they, they were the hardest things. So when you went and played, that felt easier than the net sessions. Especially if you're bowling in a net practice and an open wicket, obviously you've got the nets on the side, open, open the roof and stuff like that. And you have Jason and Stokesy and Joss, all them guys. If you start missing, you're going to get fed shit. It's going to end up in the crowd and you end up like a right muppet. So that was challenging. They were the hardest times, the, the net sessions, which made us better. It, pretty much what happens with good teams. When I won the league with Durham, we had an amazing batting. And all the bowlers like Harmony, myself, Graham Onions, challenged the batsmen day in, day out. Same with Yorkshire, and that was the same with England. Everyone just got tested every time they practiced. So when I went to the to the game, they've been in the situations before and faced the bowlers with, with pace or with spin and variation. And it was one of my the best things I've had so far in my, in my life was to bowl first, and we bowl quite nicely, and then to to put my flip flops on and go on the balcony and just watch our guys bat uh, front row uh, somewhere like Lords or Oval, where you've got a good feed. You probably get Treat yourself to some uh, sticky toffee pudding and then you get on the balcony and watch the guys go to work. It's, it was nothing better because it was stuff was happening in front of your eyes that's never happened before, like breaking records and the fastest hundred, the fastest this, the fastest that. It was incredible four years and it was so consistent. We got 300 so, so many times and obviously to get 400 to break the world record, it was a joy to, to be involved in that and it, it just went like that. And as I said, to win that World Cup at home at Lords the way we won it, uh, was as I said, it was to me. It felt like it was written in the stars, but it was an amazing journey that that four years. And and um, for you, uh, you know, you were an important member of the team, not just uh, for your playing ability, obviously. But I felt you um, you got people down to earth occasionally. You, you know, you were you had a bit of a reputation for for sort of saying quite funny things and um, and sort of making people sort of see sort of straight for you're you're honest aren't you you're a direct person and do you think that was an important aspect of the team that you had lots of different characters who could all have an impact at different times i think so i just try to be myself i wasn't too up i wasn't too down uh, i'll just speak to people and you are playing for england it is high pressured situation against good teams and there's stuff on the line but it is a game at the end of the day we all started to play cricket for fun and enjoyment so, so that was the thing for me, is I'm, I'm very lucky to be involved in this. I, I think the first time around with England, I, I was, I thought to myself, I'm very fortunate to make this squad. I'm, I'm travelling to here, I'm travelling there. But the second time I was around, I felt like I'm good enough to play for this England team. I'm good enough to help win a game. And everyone in that dressing room felt the same about, about themselves. So I think sometimes in the dressing room, you just show that how positive it is. We're lucky to be here and we're all good enough to win games. And it, as I said, it's so relaxing. We had team meals that weren't even planned. We, we'd go away to the West Indies and stuff and nothing would be organised. Then all of a sudden, you'd have the whole team having dinner together, which is not that uh, usual, you know? So it's uh, stuff like that happened all the time, which just showed how close that team was. And it must then have been extremely tough. Uh, and you've, you've talked about it a bit, you know, to, to be not part of it anymore. And the come down from the World Cup final and then you not playing for that team must have been really tough. Yeah, I think it was what it was. I mean, it's just the way that was dealt with. I've spoken about this plenty of times. I just think the management could have done it better. I could have been spoke to a little bit better, but that's the way you're going forward. If you want to improve your teams, if you want to plan for the future, then you get new blood in. And sometimes you have to make sacrifices. If I was playing well at the time, they might have thought maybe in a year or two, you might struggle. So that's fine. Like that, that is what it is, that sport. But as I said, it was just managed poorly. Uh, I miss being involved in them guys because you're playing for the best team in the world, winning winning trophies. Like who wouldn't miss that? And obviously you create good friendships and your best mates are playing. Uh, I, I miss that sort of side of it, but 
I'm at a point now where I'm happy with what I've achieved. And if someone told me I'd play my last game for England and it was winning the World Cup, you know, I would have snapped the hand up. Well, yeah, I mean, what wonderful, wonderful experience, and and you know, you had a massive part to play in that in that game as well. And and who who are you still kind of you know close with in that team? Is there a couple of players that you regularly see or talk to? Yeah, I mean, we have a WhatsApp group still, the the mm. champions WhatsApp group, where someone's birthday or some whatever, we all chip in. But I, I speak to Walks, I'm close to Woody, Johnny. Geroid, there's, there's plenty of people that I can speak to. I wouldn't feel uncomfortable calling any of them for a conversation. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll chat to them. Walks is in touch a little bit. Uh, mm. So yeah, all, all the guys are pretty close. But yeah, I, I know when I was playing, uh, as soon as you're in that bubble, like you're sometimes focused in a bubble and life goes on, doesn't it? But yeah, I've got a strong connection with most of them guys. You, you haven't actually been together since, have you? I don't think you've been since the day after the final. I don't think you've all been together in the same place, have you? Is that right? No, I think because they were trying to get ready for the uh, test match against Ireland. So we may as well just, <laughs> they may as well not went to the first day when they got cleaned up for nothing. We may as well just had to get together then and had uh, <laughs> yeah. the bus down to Falgar Square or something. But uh, hopefully, as I said, with, with upcoming events and stuff, we can all get back together. Yeah. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. And um, one final question from me. Um, what, looking at the team now, then, you've obviously watched a bit of the World T20. How do you mm-hmm. think they're shaping up? Really well, yeah. Against, obviously, you've played the last two games and they've done well. Uh, obviously, Tamar Mills has come back in, uh, been successful. He had a, he came in, did well, did the I, IPL, uh, did quite well out there and obviously struggled a bit with injuries and come back. But he's, he's performed well the last few years and in, in the 100. Uh, so he's... I think massive to that team as well. I think he can take some wickets and do well in that. Uh, but yeah, obviously looking at Pakistan, they've obviously got had their backs against the wall with what happened and people pulling out and that kind of stuff that played in in Dubai and UAE a lot. Uh, I think they're going to be the team to beat, to be honest. But there's a massive chance for England. Why not? All the guys have travelled around the world and played in all these conditions. We've got an amazing players. So there's a great chance to go back to back. Yeah, well, let's let, let's hope. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, I I I, uh, I can see it. Uh, it's a possibility. I can see England Pakistan final actually. Although I don't know if that's possible on the the way it's uh, laid out. Anyway, great. Well, that, fantastic to to hear from you. Um, let's let's get the um our members, our faithful members. Oh, um, actually, hold the... on. Hold your horses a second. Oh, sorry. Hold your hold your horses a second. Right, I've got some member questions. Also, Nate Hayes, put your hand up, and then we'll bring you in. Right. Couple of things, Simon. I'm gonna have my own question there too. Yes, please do. You know yeah. that you know that WhatsApp group you're talking about, right? I'm gonna ask it because the members will want me to ask it. Old Alex Hales, was he removed from that group, was he? Or was he only under a pseudonym? You know what I'm saying? I think you know what I'm saying. Well, right? he, he wasn't in, he wasn't in the World Cup, so he wasn't involved. Well, I know that, but I bet that WhatsApp group. Anyway, let's not even go there. Now we've covered that, guys. No, what I wanted to say to you, Liam, right? Uh, I was looking at today, March the 12th, 2007, right? You probably don't know where you were. I'll tell you exactly where you were. You were in the Gabba playing a triangular tournament game against New Zealand in a strange little Australia, New Zealand, England thing at the Gabba yeah. against England. Nobody there, right? Virtually nobody there because the Aussies didn't watch it. I was there, right? I was there. I got to the ground. You scored 15 or seven balls in England. It is 270 runs you put on the board, right? And then when New Zealand were about 110 for one, right? being annoyed by a couple of snarky New Zealanders behind me. I went and put a bet on in the ground that England would win that game, right? And it still didn't look good until you dismissed, I believe, Jacob Oram and Brendan McCullum doing a bit of middle overs enforcing, as he did. And it actually resulted in England winning by 14 runs, one actually less than runs you scored. So you actually made me 200 Aussie dollars, right? So I've been given this opportunity to thank you for that, right? Because otherwise it wouldn't have happened. That's amazing. (laughs) And I'll, get you, I'll get you two beers in Australia, won't it? That? Well, it was all right. And then, of course, you had that. So we had the finals, didn't we, in Australia? And you, that, that dismissal, I always loved that one when you took Gilchrist out. Yeah, great, great, great memories that. That was uh, a fun tour, to be honest with you, because obviously, after getting hammered in the, uh, the Ashes uh, 5 0, I was part of the, uh, the touring party, but I didn't manage to play. Uh, probably thankful I didn't at the back end of it. It was a tough series, but. Then I think it was Vaughn who came across and we had like fines due where people uh, got together, got shit faced and stuff like that and lightened the load a little bit and everyone sort of, sort of a bit of buzz about them. And then we went to that one day series with some new faces. Obviously, I was playing at uh, Joyce, Malloy, Saj Mahmood was playing. 
and it it was a great it's one of the best uh, trips of my life to be honest with you to play against pretty much your heroes that I'd grown up watching your Pontins your Gilchrist McGraths and stuff like that and to win them guys that was yeah it, it was a great trip Matt had also had the mysterious Jamie Dalrymple playing for England didn't it where is Jamie Dalrymple <laughs> what's happened to him what's happened to I remember he was uh, he was adamant that he could play Brett Lee's Yorker by like doing the whole through the legs, the little bat through the legs. He's like, I'm, I've got this down to a T, I'm going to do it. I've just, every time I watched him do it, it's going to be Brett Lee balling 96 miles an hour. I'm thinking one of your foot's going to get blew out and you're going to get sent home with a broken foot, but uh, <laughs> never, never quite worked. But uh, yeah, I forgot uh, Jamie. Uh, well, look, he's turned up, he's been found by this club. They're like Columbo's. Rob, uh, Paul Morley says, he? Said he plays at Teddington CC or whatever. He's, he's a member of. Does he really? Play. That's what's. I think you track track him down then. Does he rock up in really? his Rolls Royce or Bentley or whatever he's doing? He sounds. But right, shall I bring somebody in? Uh, anyway, um, anyway, Norts, I see you didn't spend the money you won for, uh, help with Liam. I see you didn't spend it on any ornaments or any <laughs> fancy books. Anyway, <laughs> this is very bleak. He looks like a prison <laughs> cell. <doesn't he>? Um. <laughs> Shall I bring someone in? Yes, yeah, I'll bring someone in. I'm going to bring Mr. Yes, Winston why in. don't you? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, go for it. Simon, hi. Um, Liam, good evening. And to follow my question, it's a year on hi, since no roots. So uh, many congratulations, Simon and Noughts, for uh, keeping us sustained and all that. One year, one year, Simon Hughes, one year. Oh, tonight. we've been doing this for a year. Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, anyway, um, Liam, the context of the question is that I was in America when... Uh, Major League Soccer was introduced and they had all sorts of problems trying to explain things to Americans about that game. Um, what do you see as the biggest element of cricket that the Americans will need to understand for it to be successful? I think, uh, yeah, the straight arm situation when you're trying to teach it to a kid. I think that's going to be tricky, especially for the kids growing up playing baseball who might find cricket interested and want to go across and try it. I think that's going to be the, the hardest thing to, to hopefully train people and to show people how to do it. Uh, but yeah, because as you said, growing up and baseball's drilled into a lot of kids and uh, people like that, maybe that's going to be the hardest thing to, to get across. And it's, it's obviously, it is hard because you've got your main sports, say NFL, NBA and baseball. They're massive over there and ice hockey as well. So it's hopefully we can create a space and people can give cricket a chance. Uh, hopefully they're open-minded and they'll give it a go and they'll give it a watch. But I said Nate might be a good guy to, to answer that kind of stuff. Him being a massive cricket fan and obviously being American himself, uh, probably know more about that. Going to cricket probably for, I don't know how many years he's been involved now, but he's probably seen what the difficult, difficulties are from uh, to trying to get cricket up there. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Thank you. Have you tried baseball, Ponzi? Yes, I did a little bit, yeah. Uh, 20s to whatever. I've always thought from 20s to, to I've always had a good arm. Like I back myself as one of the best arms in the, the county uh, in the country probably. But I remember going across. I thought I had a rocket, and then I had a beer or two with a couple of friends, and we went down the park in America with a mitt. One of them worked in Home Depot. One of them worked around the corner, and their arms were better than mine. So I was like, maybe it's not a, an opportunity for me to play baseball. <laughs> so I felt like everyone growing up had a rocket of an arm. So it's uh, I, I enjoyed it. It's. Uh, my first ever baseball game, I went to watch the Phillies and I got uh, swine flu, so I don't think I ever went back. So, uh... <laughs> Who else is there? Well, we have Andy. Andy's, Andy's on screen. Kid. Andy's on screen. Andy Boylan. I'm not sure we've ever had Andy on screen before. So, you know, welcome to this Hi. one year anniversary. Hi there. Welcome, Can you Andy. Okay? Yep. Great stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, great. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, Liam, I was at the um, Sri uh, game against Sri Lanka when you hit that winning six. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, best end to a game I've ever been to, I think. Um, one of the questions I've got was actually more about your test test career. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, sort of more latterly, you were seen more as an enforcer of a bowler. And I just wondered if that was sort of by choice, something you enjoyed. At the time, you were kind of in the test team with other other team, other players like Brody and Anderson, who are, you know, taking that sort of normal medium pacer role. Um, just wondered because you know, in your earlier career, you did used to swing it quite a bit. Uh, I think at the time when I went through the action, I struggled my action, and I came back and played for Yorkshire. I think 
I don't know, I sort of enjoyed that role. It was, I think one game I went and I was bowling quick and I went round the wicket and I picked up wickets and people had not faced that in England too much. And I think I played against Belly early on in the season after he just came back from the Ashes facing uh, Mitchell Johnson and he just said it was right up there. It felt intimidating. It was, it was quick. So when, I know Belly well and for him to say that, there must have been something behind it. Uh, and also it was, it was getting me wickets, intimidating people. And at the other end, you had little seamers, Yorkshire, like uh, Steve Patterson and Brooksy Brezzy, who were also like, I, I did the same from them because they're tied down and then maybe the batsman shift after me. But also vice versa, I would ball quick and then they might try and take Pato down or Brooksy down. So it worked really well. So when I got, so you got the test, test call, that's what Cookie said to me. It's like, listen, you brought in this team as that's what you do. You're balling fast and it's different to what everyone else does. But I think when you look at the wickets, when I did come back for England and I played uh, a year or two and I felt I was quite successful, a lot of the wickets were from pitching it up and swinging it. Uh, so, yeah, it wasn't just running up and bowling quick. I felt at that point after I'd been with the auction, my confidence was back. I was back in the England team. I felt I was in control of the ball, swinging it away when I wanted to. So it wasn't just to enforce a role because in test cricket, people face 90 miles an hour day in, day out. So after a couple of overs and they've dodged out of the way and you can't just go to that because it'll end up pulling you or it gets boring. Uh, so it, it's good at times uh, when you can intimidate people, pick up some wickets, uh, but then if you can go back and you can pitch it up and swing it and be accurate, I felt like that's what I did towards the back end. So ideally, would I have loved to be in an opening ball and swinging it and have a, a long test career? Yeah, absolutely. Was it, was it always down to you to decide when to you know, bowl really short and aggressive or was that captain's orders or...? I think it's a bit of both. Sometimes you get a feel. As a bowler, when I felt like I was bowling quick, it felt like you got like a bit of a power surge, to be honest with you. Uh, it felt like it was coming. You could feel like the, the pace coming up, the rhythm was good. I was attacking the crease well, and I thought, why not use this? There's no point me trying to bowl 85 miles an hour and pitch it up when I feel like I've got 92 miles an hour in the, in the locker. So let's use it. Uh, and on the flat pitches, sometimes you have to because it's not swinging and they're just dead batting it or playing it nice and easy. So sometimes the captain might come up to you and say, what do you think? Let's go hard for three or four overs. Or yourself, it's like, I feel now's the time. I'm not I'm not beating the bat. I'm not going to hit the pad. Looks like you're playing it nicely. Let's do something different. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Thanks. That's great. Good to see you. Hey, what I will say to people, before I bring it, the next person we'll bring, we're bringing the King of Teddington in next, right, himself. But before we do, uh, I will say yesterday, in our WhatsApp group, Simon, I... Was sort of hyping Liam's appearance tonight, and just because you know it's my nature, I put a little picture of Aunt Middleton, right? Who some say looks a little bit like Liam, or maybe not. And all these people said, Yeah, 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 I totally am going to be there, but nobody actually even noticed that it wasn't Liam, it was actually Aunt Middleton. So I don't know what that tells me about either the observational skills of the club members or the fact that Liam, you do look remarkably like yeah obviously i don't know the guy but i know he's probably like five foot six so i'm not sure about that he's the tiny liam the tiny liam they call him don't they? Right. i'm bringing in paul morley thank you, jamie Lord. dalrymple detective himself thank you well, do you know what it's interesting you start off with that lookalike thing because i've been looking at liam's quiff and his beard and, and I'm, I'm loving the loving the action i'm thinking that as he's poised to become the, the david beckham of um equivalent of major league cricket i'm have to invest in a bit of just for men beers to get myself a, a liam, liam plunkett lookalike career in the i office. think i need to get in that involvement well, down the, uh, well i mean you, you you you're nowhere near as bad as me i've got i've got like the guardiola beard but your hair is kind of like a bit you of, could be you could be employed at one of those parties where people turn up you could turn up as liam plunkett couldn't you? exactly yeah that's what i mean yeah i just need to get the just for men on when, when, when he becomes like you know the the, the david <laughs> in, in the states anyway moving on so i was fascinated by the chat around the, the cross scene stuff um and the reason why is I, I do a bit of helping out with the coaching the kids at, um at teddington and um the coaches are obsessed with getting the kids at eight and nine years old to bowl seam up and and you know it's quite a difficult skill as you say not, not that they're swinging it much and they sometimes swing it by accident i've always been a big advocate of getting the kids to start off holding the ball cross seam just to get that control and then graduate through to um to, to bowling the seam up. so i'd be interested to know hey firstly what you think about that um, but then secondly, talking to the kids, um, we were massively fortunate enough to be at the Oval the day after you guys won the World Cup um, for that, that whole celebration thing. And, and of course, went on the pitch um, when you guys came down there, came onto the, onto, the, onto the playing area. And actually, my two boys, the very first autograph they got was, was yours. Um, yeah, sure. so, so it'd be interesting to know, A, well, what you remember about that day, if you remember it at all, given you probably had a few, a few, a few beers the night before. So it'd be good to just, just get your memories of that. 
I think in terms of, uh, it's obviously fascinating for me too as well, because I'm going down the coaching avenue now. I was mm. doing my level three uh, as we speak pretty much. And it's, I don't know, it's always nice to be able to, a kid to be able to run up and ball cross uh, seam up and have that skill. And then down the line, be able to adapt and ball cross seam and knowing he's got the seam up in his back pocket, but also the kid's turning up and he's hitting the side net and not confident in ball. And it's like, well, how do you get enjoyment into him and let him, feel a part of that next exactly, session. Yeah, yeah. So it's obviously a, a bit of both, but I mean, ideally you want the kid to ball seam up and then give him the tools afterwards to say, all right, play around. If it's not swinging, ball some crossing. Yeah, it's interesting because it feel, feels like that when, when I do that with the kids who, who struggle with the crossing, they find it, uh, sorry, struggle with the seam, they find it easier with the crossing just because just the grip. Yeah. So yeah, it's a bit of a reverse reverse way of looking at it, I guess, but yeah, interesting <laughs> to, to get you. Yeah, I think for me, I always felt better, like especially in sweaty conditions. I'm a, I sweat a lot in, in games in India and wherever you're playing, it's hot. My hand was, was always slippy and to hold a cross seam, I felt like I could get my, my fingers yes. behind it and get that extra yeah. snap with a cross seam. Mm. And when I balled anyway, it didn't swing, so there's no point. And, and seam up didn't do much either. So, uh, But yeah, I think if a, obviously if a, a kid's in, in a net session and he's not confident, he's not enjoying it, obviously maybe... It's a bit of both, isn't it? Maybe a bit of mm. practice of let's try and do some seam up stuff, but actually go and enjoy it. Ball cross seam, ball however you want, and explore, learn for yourself mm. a little bit. Yeah. And, and about the day at the Oval, do you remember much about it? Yeah, I remember a little bit about it. I felt, <laughs> I felt bad for the kids because the fumes that would have been coming off the guy, I felt really, really bad about that. But it was pretty much put upon us. Like we finished and all of a sudden it was like in the morning, right, we're going here, we're going there. And it was like, all right, well, yeah. I mean... Obviously, it's an amazing feeling the day after, but also you want to be there and you don't want to be like a slob in front of the kids and it's sometimes you don't want to, yeah, you want to present yourself well and I'm hoping that the guys did, even though you're in a World Cup, you've got kids there who look up to you and you're role models, so you don't want to be too messy. I think, I think to be fair, they, 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 a, lot of, a lot of the uh, the fact that, I mean, you, you can pay what you guys were like to the to the 2005 Ashes with this. Yeah. So you yeah. Guys absolutely a bunch of saints, so... Um, no, I don't think the kids, uh, the kids caught on to the fact you know if you've known it before. But it was a great, great day. So uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for that. Paul, no does J does Jamie Dalrymple play for Teddington? Oh, he did a long time. I'm going back a few years now, oh, um, right. probably 10, 15 years ago. At, at much the same time, um, so David Milan played, and and obviously um, uh, Tom Harrison as well um, back yeah, in yeah. sort of early two thousand. So when he was, I, I, I guess most of these guys kind of dip in and out when they're not playing county cricket. Um, I haven't seen Dalrymple for a long time. I've, um, I was trying to track him down, actually. It'd be yeah. an interesting story, seeing what's yeah. uh, what's, what's going on. In, yeah, I guess in, in modern, like, last few years, we've had the likes of um, uh, Sam Robson and Nick Gubbins. Obviously, Nick Gubbins yeah. now has gone down down to Hampshire. But last season, in particular, where there was a COVID sort of interrupted the season, yeah. those couple of guys played a few, few yeah, times. Yeah. Too much. Yeah. Yeah. Last time I seen uh, Dalrymple, I bumped into him and he was uh, planning... Uh, I know, he's doing planning on his house in Chelsea, so he's pretty busy, I think. <laughs> he's all right. He's sorted then, is he? Right, OK. Yeah, right. I'm bringing in all the way from the US of A, Nate Hayes. That, as promised, he's on a hard deadline, aren't you, Nate? So yeah. I have... Good day. I'll call it 3 oh, kind, Nate. 3, 3 p.m. Hey, guys. How are hey, you? Great thanks, to see you. Thanks. <laughs> Nate, thanks for... you? Hey, what's up, Liam? Uh, yeah, I wanted to mention... Um, Liam was talking about the, the biggest obstacle being the straight arm thing. Mm. And, you know, me, I didn't grow up with cricket, so I had to stumble across it basically. But, and, and honestly, the first time I saw it, I was thinking, why, why don't they just throw the ball? Why doesn't that guy just throw normal? Um, you know, cause you can do a lot more with it if you just throw it normal. But, but yeah, I think that's par probably one of the things that people get bogged down in the rules and they start to try to teach the laws, I should say, sorry. Um, they get bogged down in, in, in that stuff, trying to teach Americans what, how to play, how, how the laws are, you know, what, how the game goes. And it's probably best to just watch the game. And, um, to be honest, I like to talk about the things I like about cricket when I talk to Americans for the first time, like, uh, specifically, I love fast bowling. I love the aggression of it. Um, you know, I love that the bowler can bounce it up in, in your face if he wants to. Uh, so I, I try to, I, I think the best way to get Americans in is to talk about the, the exciting things instead of, you know, the laws, what, a, what a wicket is and all these other things. I think that's the best place to start. But, but yeah, I, I remember the first time I saw someone bowling and I was like, why is he, why doesn't he, you know, cause when you watch a spinner for the first time, you've never seen cricket before. It looks like a ballerina or something, you know, it just, it looks, um, really weird compared to, to baseball pitcher, you know? 
So, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's one of the, one of the obstacles, but you, you know, when you get into the, when you watch it with someone for the first time or play it, or, or even with little kids, the best thing to do is to just go out and play and just, you know, uh, let them figure it out. And, uh, mm. yeah, but, but it's actually, they use, um, in the all stars coaching, which they do for five to nine year olds in this country, they use mm -hmm. a, a bigger ball, like almost a football to teach them how to bowl because it's so big. They can't throw it. Yeah. They have to yeah. keep their arms straight. So they yeah. sort of almost sling it like that. And that learn right. that teaches them the right, well, to keep their arms straight, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I think I think, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Cause I, I teach a beginner's uh um a beginner's thing at the com uh, community center across the street from my house. And it's for ages seven to to like eleven or so. And that's that's always a challenge is getting mm. getting them to realize what to do with their with their hips, you know, when yeah. they're, when they're bowling that way, cause they end up kind of misaligned, but mm. we just, we just start out letting them throw the ball to be honest. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then just go from there, but, it, but it's, you know, they love, they love it. Once they, once they realize they can just whack the ball all over the place, it's, you know, instead of baseball having foul balls and stuff, and you don't have to run. If, if you hit it on the ground to a fielder, you don't have to run in baseball, you have to run. So, mm that's the little things like that that that, that, that draw kids in you know mm. Mm. interesting and do you are you radio uh, do you have a radio station or is that just a fancy cap um oh this this cap this is a minor league cricket team okay. um so, so i do a, i do a weekly or i did during the season a weekly um uh youtube show about the about minor league cricket where i would okay. have guests on and and oh. I try. I tried to get the owners to give me hats, and only like two teams would do it because they, you know, they were a little stingy. But mm. um, yeah. So I wear. Well, I think you're going to be busy in the next year or two. I think it's things are going to things are starting to happen actually. So we'll keep. It'd be good if you kept kept in touch actually, because it'd be interesting to hear what's what's happening both with you Glad and Liam, of course. Gladly, yeah. Um, Liam's been very open. Um, I've communicated with with Liam a lot about about um his intentions and about, about, you know, what's going on, but, but yeah, mm. it, we're, it's definitely on the rise. It's, it's very exciting time right now. And mm. especially even with the women's game, we just had a, our first women's national championship. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, went Mexico, to the world. was it? Yep. It will. Right. That was the um, world cup qualifier prior to that, to select the team, we had a national championship, which was a, uh, which was a really big deal. Um, mm. Just uh, things are, things are looking up here. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, great. That, good to have you on. And thanks for, Thanks for joining. Um, Cheers, mate. Thank you, guys. Right, I've got Rob to bring in. I will say, Nate, uh, if you want Simon Hughes for your uh, for your podcast in the season, he is available. The <laughs> price is, if the price is right. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, I can I contribute with emerging cricket, um, and they're they're Australian, most of them, okay. and um, we just have a YouTube and we have uh, weekly podcasts. Whatever. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm rent a mouth, so you know, <laughs> go for it. Right, Rob's in the house. Hello, Rob. Hi, guys. Evening, Pudsy. Hey, Dan. Hey, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Just a uh, two-part question, really. Um, what wicket are you most proud of? And what and which batsman did you find a nightmare to bowl against and, and you never managed to get them out? Uh, I think just for the importance, and I know Kane is a good, decent friend of mine. It's obviously Kane in the final. Uh, obviously... I felt like that was a massive game change. It was a huge, it was the tiniest little, oh, just yeah, a key yeah. moment, because if those batsmen had got in, it could have been a, a lot tougher. Well, yeah, it was a yeah. tough one chance, but it could have been even more. Uh, for the fact with him as well, because I've played him for Yorkshire for a few years, I don't think I ever got him out in the nets once. So it was, uh, always, it's always <laughs> nice and to nick him off like that. Uh, we have a ball or two that I've not really got out. Uh, Where you've been like the bat played... so many times, it's just, but it's just not taking that age. I don't know. I feel like I've played that much cricket against the people. It's I'm, I'm fortunate that I probably got them out. Uh, I don't know. Because you go through patches where I remember when Shandipal came across who I played with and we couldn't get him out in a test series and no one could get him out. And he scored millions of runs in that series. And you go through where you play with against... His, because you brought Shandipal out with his stun, did you have to change how you... Your angle or the run up, such a crab like stance. It was really bent over. And I mean, you know, if you had to save save a sort of match, you'd obviously want him batting for you because he wouldn't throw his wicket away. But was he a nightmare to try and get the angles or to get the 
the thing is, he did. He started like that, but then he sort of lined up, didn't he? So it's, the ball's still there. So I felt like with the shiv is, I didn't play against well towards the back end, but I felt like if you if you bought it off stump and trying to take it away from him, he always put his hands out. Uh, that's how I felt like I'll get him out. But I think you take that away. Obviously not on his level, but still a good cricketer. Obviously Yardy from Sussex is exactly the same. Start so far out and walk across. And you need to realise, well, actually take the batsman out of it. I'm just going to ball outside off stump. Uh, so whatever that, they do, let them do it. Is that it sort of a conscious time. mindset of I'm going to ignore him moving? Like, you, you know, like what you just mentioned, from where Sussex yeah. there might be Yardy. Because he's just walk all the way across and then like nearly see his leg stump. So would you think... I could aim there, but then it's playing onto his pads. Is that sort of a, I must keep this line and ignore his sort of trigger think, movement? You can gamble, right? If you've got your field, just think early on, I'll take a punt and I'll try and blast his legs, stump, try and go York and blast his stump yeah. out. Uh, but also, you end up doing that in one day and someone sweeps you out the ground. And it's like, going nice like... but, uh, yeah, I think there's so many good players and obviously <laughs> in different reasons, people who I couldn't get out. Uh, and then people who, you know, just put you into the stands like Chris Gale and his, and his pump would do that all the time. And I find it hard. Obviously, towards the back end now, you feel like you can ball bit easier to Chris Gale and stuff. They still punish you, but you can still ball slow ball bounces and slow balls and feel like you can get away with a lot more than you used to. I played against, I was frustrated. I don't think I ever, I played against Brian Lara, uh, but I didn't ball a ball at him because he got run out. Uh, I don't think I didn't ball at Tendulkar either. Uh, he so was then, scared of you, Brian Lara. That's that's why he just ran himself out, Lara, because yeah, he just just, yeah. just didn't he just didn't fancy facing you. I no, I didn't fancy it, mate. He was, uh, <laughs> maybe he was licking his lips to get down the end. I was about to ball. <laughs> Super, thanks, Fudzy. Cheers, cheers. cheers. Right. Alex Gaywood says I was over in the states running some training a couple of years ago during the 19, 2019 Ashes. They were intrigued about cricket, so I showed them highlights of Archer's spell to Smith in the second test. They were shocked that what they pre- preconceived to be a slow and gentle game was so aggressive and dangerous. I think mm. that that's what I've as well actually Nate brought that up. People ask me that or oh, into like, can you hit them? And he's like, Well, yeah, a couple of times you like to actually pin them. Uh four day stuff, you like to be aggressive, you like to hit them in the chest and hit people in the in the jaw and the eye socket and all that kind of stuff. And, <laughs> like, what, and then what happens? Do they go to like first base or whatever? And I was like, no, they're gonna stay there or I'll crack on with it. So it's uh, that's the thing that they do find fascinating that you can intimidate and they've got to stay there and man up. Yeah, yeah, it's a great aspect of the game, actually. Yeah, right. A couple more questions. Um, no, we're done. We're out. Questions wise, we're out. We're done. We're out. Okay. We're questions. It's five right. o'clock. Well, that's that's pretty good. Um, that's great timing then. Um, thank you very much for all your questions. Uh, we're really good and. Um, you know, there's uh, there's plenty of kind of meat in the bone there. So a couple of things to say. Firstly, we're going to do the the usual weekly competition for winning this. This is, of course, Liam celebrating. I think probably celebrating Kane Williamson's wicket uh, in the final, and of course he signed that. So we'll do a question on that uh, in a bit. But first, Liam, we have to do the quiz. I'm afraid. Let's give it a and, go. Uh, you just get ready. Uh, the, the, it, it, this is called. This quiz is called. How well do you know yourself? Okay. Um, we've had quite a lot of people taking part over the uh, the weeks and months. Uh, this is the latest version leaderboard. So we've only had. This is a sort of so sort of autumn winter competition. We've had two previous ones. Paul Collingwood got ten out of ten in an earlier round. Uh, this yeah. is the current round. So Liam Livingston doing extremely well, uh, admitting that he's done nothing except sit in bubbles for months. So he's got nothing to do except look up stats. So about himself. Was, <laughs> yeah, about himself. Um, NASA, not very good, basically. So, you know, five or six is sort of average. You, you need to be aiming higher than five or six, really. But reassuringly, Alistair Cook on a, an earlier round only scored four. So that's four is the one to beat, really. Well, well, hey, I will say, Eccleston and Leach, they never get there because they won the first one, didn't they? Yes. I suppose it's because maybe they were team up. It didn't come across. People felt a little bit funny about it. I don't know. Because they got eight, didn't they, and one. Collingwood yeah. obviously won with ten. Yeah, despite... I mean, we've become perhaps a little bit more lenient in the way we mark it. Uh, anyway, so um, the, uh, the, the quiz is coming up. Um, I'm just going to get the questions ready. Right, and we start with a bit of music which is this. 
And uh, you'll be pleased to know if you get a correct answer, you get a little bit of this, which you'll recognise. He's got it! <laughs> and if you get it wrong, you get this. Mm. Okay? Got it. Ten questions. Uh, normally, it would be Simon Mann uh, as well, but uh, tonight it's just me. Um, and he I'm would just... normally have contributed five of the questions. And we're using this state-of-the-art technology to keep the score. State-of-the-art. Are you with what? 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 A, a like a little counter and a piece of paper. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right. So here we go. Question one: How many wickets did you take on your first class debut? Uh, first class. That's county. That's county debut, basically. On the in the uh, first innings of that game. Five. Oof. He's got it. Correct. Yeah. I thought Very I didn't good. know it meant. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I picked up a wicket in the first innings or second innings. So that it was. Uh, it was the It was the first innings that I looked up. Yeah. And I think it was against. Well, I'm sure it was against Yorkshire. It was. Yeah, it was yeah. definitely against Yorkshire. The wicket yeah. helped me nicely back then. Headley was a bit up and down, so it was uh, that, well, that one of my heroes actually. Uh, obviously, Darren Goff. I remember. I said. Watched him play for England and all that good stuff. And I ran up and bowled uh, a bounce to him straight, flushing the head. Uh, and the next ball, he, uh, he tried to hike me out headingly, got thick edge, caught third man. So that was, uh, yeah, that was playing against my uh, role model and obviously then hitting your role model on the back on the head. One of my role models, I think. Well, that was an amazing start. Anyway, five foot on debut. So uh, one out of one. One out of one. One, one out, out of one. one. Um, question two, sort of related to that. Who was your first first class victim in that game? Um, I kind of put Yorkshire back then. There was like Fellows and Yuvraj Singh. It was quite a well known player um, who played for England. Actually, you can't remember, can you, Licky? Correct. Well, the well remembered. Richard Blakey. Is that right? Two out of two. Yeah. Two out of two. Right. Question three. Very good. You're doing well. How many, roughly, did Pakistan score on your test match debut? And I'll give you to the nearest 50 or something. Your test match debut, which was, I think, in Karachi. Uh... Five seventy maybe, maybe six hundred. Let me go six twenty-five. He's got it. That's an outstanding guess. It was actually six hundred and thirty-eight for eight. I remember because I remember thirty odd overs on a flat pitch. I remember it. Yeah. What a start! <laughs> First test. So 638 for eight. You must have thought this is a mugs game. Yeah, no, it was obviously after the Ashes and stuff. Then we flew, uh, was it straight to Pakistan after winning that? And then we were on absolute big wickets with no bounce. So, yeah, it was welcome to test cricket. It was obviously that and facing uh, Shobak Tabo at 97 miles an hour was, uh, yeah, it was uh, opened my eyes definitely. <laughs> three out of three, then going hey, strong. Yeah. Three going out of three, strong. did well. Maybe, I'm, maybe these questions are too easy. Anyway, question four. Who were your last two test victims? Who were your last two test victims? Uh, Kohli Pajara. Pajara Kohli. Is that right? Let me think. Uh, three, no, the second innings. All right, I'm going to go... He's visualising. I'm just going to be into that Lords, isn't it? And I remember I got... Three and a two. I was thinking, which way around was it? Who's the last wicket? Modi No, it was. Let me get this right. It was Dorney. And. Who did I get out first? Coley. He's got it! Very good. Process of elimination. <laughs> Coley and Dorney. 
countdown. Yeah. Liam named everybody who'd ever played for India there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't get Sonal Gavaskar out, I know that. Well, yeah. Boom. Four out of four, though. Four out of four. Very good. Right, okay. Question five. What, what was unusual about your one-day international debut? There was a sort of strange circumstance. Uh, uh, super sub, wasn't it? I thought it was. Vikram, was it Vikram King? Was it super sub? Or... I mean, I think... Ela elaborate. Uh, you're allowed to obviously bring someone in to take place of a baller or something like that. So I think Vikram might have came in and we put in a partnership. I remember that. We put on a score of 100. That's what was the back end. So then obviously we lost the baller, then we were a baller down second innings. I think that's what it was. Well, I'll give you... I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a sort of... He's got it! I'll give you, I'll give you half a point for that. It was actually... You, you replaced KP after the first innings of the match... He, for some reason, didn't take the field and you replaced him in the team. What was that? That was at the time. Was it super sub? That was I, don't, I don't know, actually. I, I didn't read up exactly what it was about, but it was something to do with... Uh, it's sort of super sub. So I'll give you half a point, but you got the name wrong. You replaced KP anyway. So I, uh, I didn't realise that was the person who replaced. Well, well according, to, according to Crick Info, anyway. So I'll give I you thought, half. I actually thought Vikram came in. Oh, here we Fine. go. Here we well, maybe go. the stats are wrong, but um, I'm afraid, you know, I've got to go with... I'm only giving you half a point for that because you weren't really entirely sure. Um, anyway, sorry about that. So It's all right, though. It's all right because Liam has passed the cook threshold, hasn't he? I've been you passed the cook threshold already, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so what is it? Four and a half out of five. Four and a half out of five. Right, question six. How many first-class hundreds have you made? Uh, three. He's got it! Direct. Very good. Impressive. Yeah, right. I, you know what? It's, I felt like when I was with the auction, I started to play nicely. I was buying the Brazilian and Russian stuff. I felt like if I was going to play a lot of years county cricket, I did want to get 10. So that was my aim to get 10. So it's obviously disappointing that I didn't get that. But it's always nice to have hundreds on you. Oh, on your uh, stats. You know? Yeah, totally. What's the score? Um, 5.5. 5.5 out of 6, Mr Hughes. 5.5 out of 6. Question 7. Of England's most successful one-day bowlers, who has the best strike rate? Darren Goff, Andrew Flintoff, or you? Uh, me. <sighs> think. Confident? Yeah, I think so, because I think everyone was... That's at that, that point, that's what people are banging on about, is my strike rate. So... Uh... Yeah, it was me. He's got it! I'll take that. Good knowledge. And I'm going to show you um, a table here. This is uh, leading England's one-day international bowlers, best strike rates. You are top. Actually, Liam. you're showing Liam the answers to the other Show questions. The <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Uh, am I? Yeah. I reckon he's going to get eight and nine. Quick, Ian, put your spike glass. No, I, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Oh, I see. Uh, oh shit! Okay. Oh god, I see what you mean. Oh god. Oh, bollocks. Awkward. Um, have you? Have you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, at least okay. question. At least question ten is a little bit of a myth. Well, I think it makes it exciting because it, it will mean. That if we assume that Liam's going to get eight and nine correct, which I think he can, it will mean that question 10 gives him a chance to be in the lead. That's all I'm saying. All right. OK, well, um, so you've read question eight. Have you already? What, the Stokesy one? Oh, now he's playing. No, he... no, not the Stokesy one. This is question eight is how many T20 counties oh, or no, overseas? Played Definitely played for nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think... OK, I'll have to give you that. But um, I, actually, and, and I'm only going to give you it if you can name them all. Oh, that's outrageous. Frank, I'm going to write this down. So Durham. Durham class is one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Durham uh, class is one. Dolphins. Durban. Yorkshire. Surrey. Delhi. Melbourne. Is that one, two, three, four, five, six? 
I think I played for more because then I played for Silet. Silet, did you? Oh. Played for Silet. I think you got this wrong because I've also played for three uh, ch- uh, Chattergrown Challengers. I've also played for. Well, you uh, said nine, but so so you got the answer wrong as well then. What does the answer say on there? You can only go by the exam sheet, right? Yeah, but if you but if you said three extra ones, I would have given you it. I'm I'm going. I'm, I'm naming them for you. Okay, so. so right, I'll just, on, you just get... <laughs> got Durham, Dolphin, Yorkshire, sorry, Delburn, Melbourne, sorry, Delhi, Melbourne, Select, uh, Chattagong Challenger. You had Corella Kings. Uh, had. Punjabi Warriors, I think. Yeah, that's it. All Sorry. right, well, we'll have to give you it. Okay, all right, fine. <laughs> I'll have to give you that. All right. Um, right, so what's that? What's the score, North? It's, it's currently 7.5 out of eight. Two questions to go. If Liam gets them both right, he goes top of the table. So Stokes right. is the next one. Well, so who has a better one day batting strike rate? You, Mo and Ali, or Ben Stokes? It was Stokes selling, wasn't it? It was me. It's you. It was me. Stokes, 95. Moen, 101. Plunkett, 102. Maybe I just, yeah, I didn't. Because you got the previous one wrong, I wasn't back in, back in this one either. So. <laughs> no. I'll take that. That's, that's, right that's, that's poor. Well, I mean, you, you, so you've got, you, you're a winner and a loser there. You've got the best strike rate, but you got the answer wrong. Never mind. So what's that? Eight and a half, is it? No, yeah. that's seven point five out of nine. Right. Okay. Right. Last question. A uh, bit of a kind of weird one. What do the England lads say is your best dressing room asset? Uh, like joking around, pretty much. Joking, maybe. Prankster. He's, hand- He's got it. A- Correct. Yeah. They say you're very funny and you have good one liners. So why can't we have them on here then? <laughs> Must be a generation thing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, doy. Well, there we go. We've, won. We've just got one, haven't we? See we have there. got one. We See just got one there. from Liam Flunkett. Just... Abuse. <laughs> Sledging. Yes, right. Fine. I got I got the picture, mate. Thanks. Uh, okay. I got the message. Right, Come so on. the final score, the final score is Liam uh, scored 8.5 out of 10. If only he'd have taken a few more seconds to read that question that was on screen for at least three and a half minutes. I think I was, yes. I was under the pressure. I'm sweating because my wife's got loads of uh, laundry on her next to the radiator, so I was, oh. <laughs> I was sweating my tits. Anyway, off. congratulations. Eight, eight and a half was a, 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 an excellent performance. Well done. Right, so we've got one final duty. And the final duty is to um, find a winner for this. Um, so we are going to get you to ask the question in just a second. But before you do, um, just to say, this obviously is, is Liam at the World Cup final, uh, sign the picture. I will send this to the winner, uh, the first person on the chat box, those of you who haven't played this before, who tries to answer the question or does answer the question that Liam is going to ask, right? So get your fingers ready on your laptop keyboards. Liam, what is your question? My question is, who was my favourite bowler growing up to watch? And it, it's an international bowler, obviously. Yeah. No, they've all gone golf, you see, and they're not right. That'd be yeah. too easy. I said that earlier. It's too easy. Yeah, you've, you've kind of given them a red herring there with Goff, actually, haven't you? So we've got uh, Malcolm Marsh. Oh, 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 we've win. got we've got Ambrose. We've um, got right. a winner. We have we've a got winner. A winner. Um, okay, Liam, what's the answer? Yeah, it's Curly Ambrose. Curly, I'd, growing, growing up, obviously watching uh, Intimidate, the English batsman, and I just loved the way he bowled. He was obviously that West Indies. Uh, duo of him and Walsh. I used to love watching them, but Ambrose was definitely my favourite. Brilliant. Well, well done, Alex Gaywood. You've got it. Uh, so that's the second contribution of the evening, and uh, a very good, uh, good contribution it was too. Good, good, good luck. Um, don't forget to send us your address. I know I've probably got it somewhere, but send us it again anyway. 
either send it to me or send it to the WhatsApp group. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that's it, Liam. Um, brilliant uh, contribution from you as well tonight. Very consistent. Lots of uh, little back of the handers. I thought he was particularly strong in the middle, wasn't he? Really good, good in the middle. <laughs> good yeah, in the middle. A little bit weak at the end. No, no, he wasn't weak at the death. He was he strong at the end. Half out of ten. So he's uh, he's shown he's got the, the skills at the death as well. Yeah. Oh, you know? I don't mind. I don't mind doing the grunt work, mate. So it's uh, I managed to get through it. And um, when are you actually heading off to, to the States then? Uh, I just spoke to the, the the Major League now about the visas and stuff. So I'm thinking my, my, my wife would like to go back and see the family before Thanksgiving. But it might be the fact I go across there and bounce back to, to do my visa in December for five days. So probably middle of November. Okay. Well, uh, really good luck with it. And you'll be living in Philadelphia, will you? Yeah. West, about where four, is it? West Virginia County or something? Westchester, yeah, yeah, Pennsylvania. So it's about 40 minutes from Philly. So Okay. Wow. So if did. anyone's there, if anyone's in Westchester, give me a shout. I'll grab a coffee. But Oh, there you go. There's an you're gonna need, um You're going to need a big, thick coat, presumably, in that area, aren't you, this time of year? Yeah, it'll get cold uh, towards maybe after January, February, it gets really cold. So. Uh, but you come from Middlesbrough, so you're used to it. Yeah, I'll have my singlet and my uh, speedos on there, obviously. <laughs> Listen. So good luck with it, anyway, and, and keep in touch because we we want to we want to see see how you get on. Good luck with it. Um, yeah. But the World Cup film that you're very uh, prominent part of, by the way, is coming together, and it'll be out in February, March sort of time. I'll send you the uh, we're doing a uh, we're doing a second cut now, so I'll send you that in in a week or two, and you can see how we're getting on. You've got some nice Perfect. some nice lines in it, and very good luck with everything. And um, you know, thanks for being our brilliant guest. Uh, cheers. Cheers, guys. Appreciate it. Feel, feel free to leave. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys.